welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Welcome to All Things Policy. I'm Aditya, and I'm joined by Pranav. And what we're going to do today is look back at year 2022 in space and also make a few predictions for the year 2023, which I'm sure will go wrong in some unexpected way, but and it'll be fun to make these predictions. So firstly, welcome welcome to our first uh, space episode in 2023. Yeah, thank you, Aditya. It's great to be talking about space once again. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, uh, so all right, let's go over what has happened this year. This uh, 2022 was, you know, a, a pretty special year as a space things go, you know, 2020 and 2021, you know, did see a lot of huge developments in India and around the world, except for, of course, in 2020, India uh, created an independent regulator. But let's go over 2022. What for you, just globally, are some of the big, uh, just a couple of the big highlights for you from this year? So for me, most of these highlights actually come from the United States. And uh, the first one that I observed this year was the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. We've been waiting for its launch and we've been eagerly waiting for what kind of images it would release for about six to eight years now. It came into being in the 1990s when the National Academy of Sciences had this survey, which they conduct every once in 10 years, and it's called the Astronomical Decadal Survey where they called for this telescope. And because of many, many issues and technological issues, budgetary issues, it took about 20 years to come into fruition. And finally, it it was launched. So the James Webb Space Telescope is a technological feat in itself. Having such mirrors and the software that it takes to process infrared images to color images, and the way in which it does it is, I find it extraordinary. So that is the first highlight. The second highlight, I think, uh, for me is that SpaceX, in 2021, they had completed just about 30 launches with the Falcon 9 rocket. And this year, they doubled that number to 61 launches. You know, they managed to get that one extra launch in the end of the year. And that is absolutely fantastic. It is 60 launches is more than what uh, SpaceX's competitors, Boeing and uh, ULA, the United Launch Alliance, North of Bremen and uh, the United North Launch Alliance have been able to do. And SpaceX has absolutely disrupted this industry. In fact, it's also one launch more than what China did. China had about 59 or 60 launches, given the way you count the number of launches they did, which is a record for China itself, because it was able to launch about one or two rockets once every week. And so this year, globally, it was extremely busy when it came to space launches. Every week there was something happening and it made it quite difficult to keep track of. Finally, Aditya, it's that Artemis has finally taken off ground. The Artemis, the, 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 the Orion spacecraft made it around the moon, a very long journey, and it made it safely back on Earth. And uh, globally, these are the three things that I think are the highlights of the Earth. Yeah. Of course, there are a few other highlights that you could talk about, but... Yeah, uh, that's just, in, you're right, Pranav. You know, I think that we've, we've seen some really extraordinary developments coming, you know, both from NASA and from the private sector in the US. And I think it has been a great year, especially for the United States, more than perhaps any other country. And as, a, you know, I just to add to that is, is simply the DART mission. Uh, the very fact that NASA went and, you know, intercepted an astro- asteroid some 11 million kilometers from the Earth you know, even if it's sort of, it's more like a redirection than an intercept, the very fact that it could do that is both a scientific achievement, uh, scientific and engineering achievement, and also something that at some level should just disquiet us just because of how, just the, the scale and the ambition of a project like that, because we simply don't know how such projects might be used or what significance they might have in the future. But still, yeah, an extraordinary year all around for the United States. You know, one country that didn't have a great year was, was actually Russia, right? So I mean, Yes, uh, uh, Russia <laughs> didn't have a great year this time. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, uh, the year started off with the war in Ukraine, with some sanctions on the Russian space program. You had the head of the Russian space agency, Roscosmos, 
Dmitry Rogozin making some interpret remarks about the International Space Station and so on. You have to cancel, for example, one web launches. It's just not been a great year. And the fact that Russia's space agency remains under even more sanctions than it was under, you know, after 2014, the first Russo-Ukraine war, just means that it's going to face a lot more restrictions. It's going to be more cash strapped. Of course, Pranav, you had mentioned earlier when we were talking about how they're looking for some creative solutions out of this, at least as far as funding is concerned, right? Yes, they actually want to establish public bonds to catch up with the United States. Now, the Russian Space Agency has many design bureaus and factories to manufacture satellites, and they want to ramp up manufacturing of satellites, probably one satellite a week, or if they're lucky, you know, one satellite in two weeks, and just catch up to the United States. That's the plan that they have, but it's very early stages to talk about it. So we don't know how far this will come. And Russia launches, you know, Russia actually has launched. They have the Soyuz 2 that's working really well for them. They have the Angara series of rockets that were actually tested in 2020 and 2021. Those were quite successful. So the Russians had everything in place. They were even ready to launch a rover with the European Union, with the European Space Agency. And that got cancelled. And Yuri Borisov took over from Dmitry Rogozin, expressed his disappointment. But another thing important, what I found quite fascinating is, you know, despite all these sanctions on Russia, the International Space Station cooperation is still going quite well, right? In fact, it's going so well that Russian astronauts are able to take rides on the SpaceX Crew Dragon and they're able to dock with the ISS. In fact, Russia had a very bad year in such that they had a fluid leak from the Soyuz capsule on its way to the ISS. And the crew will likely have to be rescued on an American spacecraft. So that's part of the agreement that they have and also the international agreement on the rescue of astronauts. So international cooperation is somehow sustaining despite all the unfortunate things that are happening on Earth. Yeah, and and what's also sad, I think, for India's point of view is that India has lost an effective and trusted partner in space exploration with the troubles that Russia is having. Because, for example, India, you know, was cooperating with Russia and had trained some of its people in Russia for the Gabanyan in the space, space flight program. And even more broadly, I mean, India would like to, you know, would have liked to cooperate with Russia on a whole host of potential projects, including lunar exploration at some point. But as of now, all those things seem more distant than they did just one year back. And also talking about domestic things, India also had its, not a bunch of successes, but it had somewhat you could call milestones with what it achieved. The first one I would like to highlight is the launch of the small satellite launch vehicle. It is a four-stage solid booster rocket, which can carry up to 500 kilograms to low Earth orbit. The, The launch wasn't successful, but given the track record of how different private companies are also struggling with their small satellite launch vehicles. Astra, which was a company that had a really small rocket, almost when it went bust. Firefly, which had to restructure itself and go to go out of bankruptcy, also had a last minute failure in its final stage. So it's a difficult year for small rockets, but it is nonetheless a milestone for India. What do you think about uh, what India achieved this year? Yeah, I mean, I think SSLB was actually significant in the sense that, you know, while this particular launch basically failed, I know that the EOS satellite, you know, is basically useless. So I called it a partial success. And I don't think that's just bluster. I think that, you know, the launch actually validated a lot of the performance parameters of the SSLV. And we're likely to see a lot more successful SSLV launches in the future. Yeah. The other thing is, I think that, uh, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, you also had a uh, you know, the uh, NVM3, you know, which is basically a GSLV launch vehicle, right? So ISRO did launch 36 OneWeb satellites uh, this year, which is incredible. And what's, and to me, that's, it's emblematic of both how far ISRO has come, you know, with the whole GSLV project, the fact that GSLV is now mature technology, the fact that commercial players are uh, willing to entrust their crown jewels, like 36 of their satellites, to something like the GSLV, the NVM3. I think it's quite remarkable. And uh, I, I think it's emblematic of the growing connection between the private sector and this role, uh, in India. Now, when speaking of private sector, I think the others, you know, of course, uh, the one that we have to talk about is Skype. The very fact that in November, the Skyroot 
private company managed to do a private launch from Sri Hari Kota in November. I think it's amazing. Now, of course, this is a suborbital flight. So it's not like the Skyrim Vikram S rocket went and put something into orbit. But, you know, this is again test proof of concept for uh, much bigger things to come. And the fact that, you know, you said this is not a great year for small rockets, that's absolutely true. I think the one exception for here is actually the Vikram S. You, know, you have this uh, single stage solid fuel rocket that has actually largely worked and met its parameters. The other similar development that I think didn't achieve as much or receive as much tension is actually, you know, is Antico, which is another Indian rocket company, ASR of Chennai. And uh, they have these amazing 3D printed rockets and Agnico didn't send anything to space, but it actually test fired its Agnilet. And as far as I know, Agnilet is actually the only a such 3D printed uh, rocket engine in the world. And it's a semi-cryogenic sort of engine. So basically what it means is it uses, you use liquid kerosene, which is a normal fuel that's used, normal liquid propellant, and you, which you use it along with liquid oxygen, with LOX. And, uh, you know, that brings efficiencies to the design. So I, I think those are actually remarkable developments that we might, I think, look back on in 20 years and consider milestones in, in India's rocketry and India's generally its uh, space bearing capabilities. Speaking of engines, uh, there was this news that actually, I think, went amiss earlier this year. In March, I think some, sometime in May or June, ISRO, in September, sorry, in September, ISRO tested this very unique rocket engine. It's a hybrid rocket motor. It has a both solid fuel and liquid oxygen. And it is one of the first types of hybrid rocket motors that ISRO has created. And even though we don't know where it will be used, I think it's quite fascinating that they're using these hybrid technologies to have go on the rockets because solid fuels are very, very useful because they can be stored for a very long time. And probably, you know, in a situation where you want to have rapid launch capability, you could also have emergency liquid oxygen tank sitting it could just refuel your rocket and send it in very short notice so that's one that's more thing right. i found fascinating absolutely absolutely there are a lot of these interesting experiments going on and they may not always have spectacular results right now but i think that they off in the future now Pranav, any other big highlights for you this year if not i want to move on to asking you now you know this is the hazardous part of the episode i want to ask you about predictions what do you what are your big predictions for, you know, just let's start, start with civil space. What are your predictions for the world and what are your predictions for India? For the world, it's going to be a very silent year. I don't think much would happen because a lot of these programs in 2022 just came together at the right time. And so many of these activities just happened at once that 2023 is going to be quite silent. Some fascinating things we might get are SpaceX's uh, Starship. Uh, launch. It would be a full stack launch where they're not just launching the final stage, which is the Starship booster. It's going to be a massive rocket. It's going to do a belly flop and it's probably going to try landing. So it's going to be a very beautiful thing to watch. Indians will probably have to stay awake till 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. So I think to witness this on video. The other one is the ULA, the United Launch Alliance, is a private company in the U.S. that wants to replace two of its rockets old rockets, the Atlas V and the Delta IV Heavy. Uh, both of these will be replaced by something called the Vulcan Centaur. The Vulcan Centaur has been in contract for like 10 years. They might test launch it this year. And it's going to be a, it's not going to be a game changer or, or anything, but it's got to be less number of rockets for them to operate. And for the US Space Force, which is the primary contractor, the Vulcan is actually a program under the US Space Force's National Security Space Launch Program. So yeah, those are the two highlights for me and we'll see more Starlink satellites being launched, more OneWeb. In the private sector wise, we had a bunch of cool things happen this year. Poland purchased a one satellite from a French company. I think it's a French company, I'm not sure. It's essentially an Earth observation or spy satellite for Poland. And in this trend I find fascinating where countries that don't really have space capabilities are able to buy private services in a, in a much better way. The UAE do this all the time. They contract private companies in Japan and South Korea to manufacture satellites for them. Even though they design it in-house, they outsource the manufacturing and they launch it on a Falcon 9. And yeah, the United Arab Emirates is a space bar. So that I find quite fascinating. All these oil petro states using their vast financial resources to sort of break into the space club. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Pranav, that's a great set of predictions. I'll just start with the last one. I mean, I think you're right about the outsourced space powers. You know, I think that's a business model that Atlix has it now. We'll work out. You can actually uh, outsource your satellite manufacturer, perhaps even its design, could launch somewhere else. You can have control center in your country and even your control center, you know, if you're one of those uh, petro states in the Gulf, uh, you're very good at uh, attracting the right kinds of immigrants to do a lot of that work. So yeah, that's a way to build a space program really quickly. It may not give you the sort of long-term capabilities that larger countries want, but it can get you some of the basic space capability and, and also for prestige. Saudi Arabia is another country that's doing this. And uh, you know, in a sense, I think that developed countries are also actually uh, doing becoming sort of outsource space bars in the sense that there it's not, you know, it's not so much uh, the government's doing the outsourcing, it's it's private companies. So, you know, in the United States, which is a major space bar, uh, you do have private companies basically outsourcing a lot of these these bits and pieces of uh, space missions to others, both within the country and outside. And, uh, you know, so you you have this, the development, I think, of the, of this ecosystem, which I think is something genuinely new. The other thing that I would add in front of your set of things to look out for, at least, in uh, 2023 are a couple of lunar launches. So one is the IM-1 lunar launch, which is uh, supposed to go to something called Shoulders Valley on the near side of the world. And it's, this is built by IM stands for Intuitive Machines, which is, you know, again, it's not NASA, it's, it's a NASA partner. And uh, the other is uh, a company called Astrobotic, uh, which is has something called the Peregrine Lunar Lander, which they're again expecting to land uh, next year somewhere near the so I think it's quite interesting that you're seeing these small private landings of, you know, uncrewed aircrafts, uncrewed craft or probes onto the moon. And uh, yeah, that again, I think is likely to be something back on in the future as something significant. What would be your predictions, if any, for, now for India? I think India will try to attempt to have a couple of more PSLV launches this year because because ISRO essentially gave licenses to both LNT and another private company to manufacture more components of the PSLV rocket. So we might see the production ramp up a little more, but still quite insufficient for a country like India that has had a space program for a very long time. And what is another cool thing is that we might also see two launches of the uh, GSLV, Mark III or the LVM III. The first one would be the commercial launch where they launch one web uh, small satellites. And the second is perhaps the uncrewed launch of the Gaganyan program. It was supposed to happen in 2024 first quarter, but they pushed it back to late 2023, which is a really good thing. Uh, they're still trying to keep the program as tightly scheduled as possible. It was supposed to launch in 2021 when Prime Minister Modi announced it in 2018. The target was 2021, 2022, but uh, COVID-19 disrupted everything. Uh, but still, it's quite fascinating that they are, they are still trying to do all these things at a very, very short time span. Okay, all right. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's those are pretty good predictions, but I think those are likely to come true. So yeah, uh, damn you for making the most likely prediction. So that, what that leaves me with is the task of basically making the uh, courageous predictions so I'll just stick to one. And I think that one is basically that India will finally release its much discussed space policy in 2023. For background, India came out with a space bill five years back. A draft space bill uh, was full of all sorts of basic problems. You know, it was very state-led. It gave all, all sorts of arbitrary powers to the government and so on. And in eventually, you know, basically with all those negative comments going its way, the government said, all right, we're going to revise this. And uh, so that's supposed to come out also sometime. Who knows, it might come out in 2023. But one thing I will say is I think the space policy, which is supposed to precede the space, uh, will come out this year. And I think there'll be a few things in it. I'm going to try and predict some broad details. And uh, we can circle back when, if and when policies are released to see just how wrong I was. So uh, I think the good part is that I think there's very clear political signal in India supporting the space industry. So this is evident, for example, in the very fact that the prime minister actually pushed for the creation of the Indian Space Association as an industry body. So, you know, I think that and the fact that in space was created as an independent regulator and facilitator does suggest that there is political commitment at the highest levels 
to get this right and to encourage India's private space sector as an important part of overall national pie. So I think that in that sense, broadly, the tone of the policy will be sound. But to me, the bad one thing is that I think it will still be more ISRO-led and there'll be more vetoes for ISRO than the private sector will typically like. Private sector companies would have to be very diplomatic about this, but we don't have to be as diplomatic here at the Pishila. And uh, so that's the good and the bad. If there's an ugly, I would say that it's that I'm not sure that India is going to get the issues around liability correct. So I think just to uh, sort of simplify this, uh, in 1972, there was a liability convention. And basically what this, and India is a party to the liability convention. And uh, what it basically says is that, you know, countries are responsible when their spacecraft cause damage in space. So, for example, if an Indian satellite smashes into a Bulgarian satellite and uh, uh, so India is liable to pay damages to Bulgaria and if there's any debris from that uh, collision and that debris causes damage to other satellites, then India has to go and pay all of those other damages as well. So, so there's a very simple and straightforward mechanism here for liability establishing that. The challenge is, of course, when you have private companies and we have a uh, ownership that's distributed across national territories, how do you assign liability? And I think that this is something which came up in the draft space policy bill in 2017 that was a major concern to private players. I don't think that space policy, at least, is really going to solve that. And I, and I suspect there's going to be a lot more back and forth about in India about liability. Yeah. I've been waiting for, we have been waiting for the space policy since May 2022. So yes, the anticipation is building. We are all very excited. We are still, the fact that we are still excited about a space policy is quite to something else, right? You don't have to be in anticipation for so long, but somehow we are still in anticipation. But thanks, Aditya, that was bringing up some of these aspects, especially liability. I had never thought about it. Because the US model was always to ask these private companies to buy their own insurance. But we're talking about smaller startups here. So insurance, and I do not know what is the the landscape of space insurance in India. But yeah, this is this will be a very, very challenging task to navigate for the government. You know, Pranav, if we are so inclined, we'll uh, do an entire episode on space liability one day. It's, it's quite an interesting uh, subject and we should probably get a lawyer on board it. Yeah, so definitely. Fun. None of us are lawyers, even though we sometimes pretend to be in all these podcasts where we talk about complex legal treaties of outer space. Anyway, thanks so much, Pranav. This has been a fun episode and it will be interesting to come back and see how our predictions have played out. And uh, thank you all for listening to All Things Policy. We do once in a while record these episodes on uh, matters relating to space and we hope to do many more such episodes. A lot of interesting work uh, that we are doing, uh, Pranav, for example, is doing a lot of heavy lifting on something called the Open Ended Working Group, which is basically a forum in which a bunch of states are exploring how we can reduce uh, space threats and the very fact that the very terms of that debate, for example, are under contestation. So it's, it's very interesting to see how the politics of Earth affect the our activities in space. And we will keep following these developments and we will keep telling you about them. We keep making sense of them and offering our analysis and our recommendations. Thank you all for listening to All Things Policy. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website, takshashila.org.in.